السلام عليكم وعليكم السلام ورحمه الله وبركاته والصلاه والسلام على رسول الله المصطفى صلى الله عليه وعلى اله وصحبه اجمعين اعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم جاء الحق وزهق الباطل ان الباطل كان زهوقا I bear witness that Muhammad, the son of Abdullah of Arabia, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, peace and blessings of God be upon him, is the messenger of God. The God of Abraham, not the moon God or the Arab God or the God of the Middle East. No, the Lord of the heavens and the earth. Adonai Elohim, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. When Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, prostrated himself on the Mount of Olives and worshipped God, that is the same God, we believe, who sent Muhammad, peace be upon him, Six centuries later, I believe the Prophet was who he claimed to be. He said, "Ana Sayyidul Bani Adam, wala fakhri. I am the master of the children of Adam, and I do not boast." He said, "Ana Khairul Khalqi Allah. I am the best of creation. We believe that he's better than the Kaaba in Mecca. He's better than the angels. He's better than the Temple of Solomon. He's better than paradise." You see, when the Prophet was preaching in Mecca, his tribe, the Quraysh, they would send messengers to the outlying borders of the city to intercept visitors, to spread lies and slanders about him. Right? And then these same people, right, they would say, you know, stay away from this man Muhammad. He's a sahir, he's a sorcerer, he's going to bewitch you. These same people would seek out the Prophet, actually listen to what he says, you know, listen to him, and they would convert to Islam on the spot. You see, they met the Prophet's enemies before they had met him. The vast majority of Americans have never really met the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. They've only heard what his enemies have said about him. And you can never rely on your enemy to give you an objective, unprejudiced, disinterested account of anything. Mr. Wood's criticisms and polemics are nothing new. The Western Orientalists have vilified the Holy Prophet for hundreds of years. Montgomery Watts says, of all the world's great men, none has been so much maligned as Muhammad, end quote. Yet the Prophet's message continues to resonate in the hearts of the faithful and Islam continues to grow. How? Because God tells the Prophet in the Quran, Wallahu ya'asimuka minan nas, and God will defend and protect you from the violence and slanders of men. The Prophet's defense counsel is God himself. The skeptic like Mr. Wood cannot possibly entertain such a notion. So he concludes that Muslims must not know the so-called truth about Muhammad. No, we know the truth. It's no secret. It's no, Karen Armstrong says, we know more about Muhammad than a, about, about the founder of any other major religion. He's the only historical prophet. Now, the, only, the, the most important thing tonight is to be objective and balanced in our critical methodology. You see, the typical Christian critique of the prophet of Islam is extremely superficial, surface level, and one-dimensional. Things are looked at purely at face value, and then the worst possible motives are ascribed to them, which in reality is only a reflection of the mental depravity of the criticizers. If a psychiatrist shows you an ink blot and all you see is sex and violence, the problem is you. Deaf, dumb, and blind, they have no sense. But it's not your fault. I understand. You are what you read. The Bible is an anthology of sex and violence. So, you know, a man with hepatitis, he doesn't go around blaming other people because they look yellow. He has a disease in his eyes. He is the problem. He perceives the world through his own diseases. So Mr. Wood's, Mr. Wood's analysis is not surprising. This is a man, the Holy Prophet, peace be upon him, who is widely regarded by many scholars of Western academia as the most influential human being to ever step foot on the earth for all of the earthly work of all of the previous prophets put together is not equal to what this one man achieved. D. Brown, a Christian missionary, says, by any standard, Muhammad's achievements were little short of miraculous. Will we just dismiss him on a superficial level? R.B. Smith says that the Prophet was absolutely unique in history. That's a Christian missionary talking. His life is based on history, not mythology or conjecture. And it's not enough to say he was a great genius, he was a, a good statesman, he was a military hero. There's a lot more to this man. Alphonse de la Martin says in the history of Turkey, quote, that is Muhammad as regards all standards by which human greatness may be measured. We may well ask, is there any man greater than he? God reminds the Prophet of this very fact in the Quran. Have we not raised high the esteem in which thou art held? Dr. William Montgomery Watt, who died last year at age 97, widely regarded as the last of the great Western Orientalists, in an interview conducted in 1999, in his 90th year, he finally conceded, quote, 
I believe that Muhammad, like the earlier prophets, had genuine religious experiences. As such, I believe that the Quran came from God, end quote. In his book, Muhammad at Mecca, he says, to suppose Muhammad an imposter creates more problems than it solves. And finally, Annie Basant, a non-Muslim, an author of the book, The Life and Teachings of Muhammad, concludes, it is impossible for anyone who studies the life and character of the great prophet of Arabia, who knows how he taught and how he lived, to feel anything but reverence for that mighty prophet, one of the greatest messengers of the Supreme. When the prophet was 12 years old, it was a Christian in Syria who first noticed signs of prophecy in him, Bahira the monk. When he was 40 years old, the first man to testify to his messengership was a Christian scribe, Waraka bin Nawfa. Look at the irony. Mr. Wood says in one of his uh, articles online that in the Meccan period, the prophet Muhammad was, quote, humble, devout, obedient, faithful, peaceful, and an outstanding moral example, end quote. You see, the vast majority of the Christian criticisms against the holy prophet originate from the Medinan period of the prophet's life. In other words, the last nine or ten years of his life. And these primarily revolve around two issues, his marriages and the application of sacred law. The fundamental Christian questions are, how does Muhammad, peace be upon him, go from a suffering preacher prophet in Mecca to a sword-wielding warrior? in Medina? How does he go from a passively resistant monogamist to an actively resistant polygamist? The Muslim follow-up question is, did the prophet change or did the external circumstances change? You see, in Mecca, the prophet was a persecuted man, a hunted man, a man with no earthly dominion, very much like Jesus Christ in Galilee. Revelations describing societal and political laws were not yet revealed until much later in Medina. Why? Because the prophet is in no position to enforce political or societal laws in Mecca. He's just a citizen of the city. But in Medina, he was the king, the president, the sultan of the city, recognized and legitimate state authority. And it is the responsibility of the state to enforce laws and exact justice. Read Romans chapter 13. Paul says almost the same thing verbatim. So the prophet in Medina resembled Moses, which is a fulfillment of prophecy. God tells Moses in Deuteronomy 18, 18 in Hebrew, I shall raise them up a prophet from amongst their brethren, like unto thee, like you, and I shall put my words into his mouth, and he shall speak unto them all that I shall command him. All six canonical books of Hadith tell us that the Prophet never sought revenge for a personal wrong or injury. But when the laws of God and the rights of man had been breached, he was unflinching and justifiably authoritative. That was his job in Medina. He's the head of state. The Jews of Medina would seek out his judgment in their cases, in their grievances, because they knew he was the epitome of justice and generosity. The pre-Islamic Arabs gave him the title, as sadiqul Amin, the spirit of truth and trustworthiness. Martin Ling said, he was too full of truth to deceive and too full of wisdom to be self-deceived. We believe that the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, is the apocalyptic Barnasha, the son of man of Daniel chapter 7, who reproved the world of sin, justice, and righteousness. But at the same time, and this is the greatness of the Holy Prophet, peace be upon him, he was meek and humble and lowly and forbearing and merciful. And his, and his enemies used to make fun of him because of that. They used to call him effeminate. Why? Because he never raised his voice. He would weep frequently. He was compassionate and nurturing. He loved children. Once while he was kissing his grandsons, a tough uh, Bedouin chief came to him. And he said, you kiss, your, you kiss your children? I have ten sons, and I've never kissed a single one of them. He said, then there is nothing in my religion for those who have no compassion in their hearts. He never returned an evil for an evil. He embodied the Qur'anic injunction. <inaudible> Repel evil with beauty. Now, during the battle of Uhud, in the third year of the Hijrah, which is prophesied in Isaiah chapter 21, the Meccans, the unbelievers of Quraysh, they sent an army of 3,000 to pillage and plunder the city of Medina. The Prophet dispatched an army of 700 men, himself included, to defend the city. During this battle, the Prophet suffered a series of tragic events. He witnessed in front of his own eyes the slaughter of his blessed companions, the slaughter of his family members. Sayyidina Hamza, radiallahu anhu, the Prophet's uncle, and more like his brother, they were very close in age. He was killed, his body mutilated, his nose and ears cut from his body, his internal organs removed and cannibalized on the battlefield. 
Can I get some water? I'm sorry. Can you get Brother Tokura? Thank you. <clears throat> the Prophet himself suffered multiple injuries to his blessed face. Blood was pouring down the face of the Messenger of God, peace be upon him. You know what he was doing? He was trying to catch the blood with his hands like this and absorb the blood with his sleeves. And then he told his companions in the vicinity, he said, if one drop of this blood should spill upon the earth, a terrible chastising punishment will immediately descend upon the Quraysh, his enemies. His companion said, O oh, Messenger of God, let the blood flow and let the punishment come. He said, I was sent as a mercy, not to curse. And then they saw him a short time later with his hands raised in supplication. Did he finally curse his enemies? You know what he said? Allahumma ahdi qawmi fa innahum la ya'lamun. O oh God, guide my people, for they don't know. Even in such circumstances, he refused to curse his enemies, but only prayed for their guidance. And you know what? The leaders of the unbelievers on that day, Abu Sufyan ibn Harb, Ikrama ibn Abi Jahal, Khalid ibn al-Walid, and uh, Wahshi, the man who killed Hamza, and Hind ibn Utba, the woman who cannibalized his body, they all became Muslim within a few years. Within a few weeks, because the Prophet did not give up on them. He did not return an evil for an evil. God describes him in the Quran. Azizun alayhi ma anitum harisun alaykum. It grieves him in his very soul that you should perish or be lost. Deeply concerned is he about you. Fabima rahmatim min Allahi lintalahum. It is part of the mercy of God that you deal gently with them. He was a gentle soul. He said, Love is my foundation, reason is my guide. He said, nasi, nafsik. Love for humanity, which you would love for yourself. Not love your enemies and the Gentiles or dogs and pigs, as Matthew says. No, love humanity. He said, La hatta tu'minu, wa la tu'minu hatta tahabu. None of you will enter paradise until you truly believe. And none of you will truly believe until you love one another. Shall I tell you of something that will increase your love? They said, yes. He said, Afshu salama baynakum. Spread peace amongst yourselves. And this applies to everyone. The Prophet is the universal messenger. He's rahmatil alameen, a mercy sent unto all creation. But there are some people in the world who don't want peace. They want death and destruction. And sometimes tempered violence is necessary to create peace. In pre-Islamic Arabia, tribal warfare was the order of the day. This was the harshest environment in the world. But when there is war, we have rules of engagement. According to Sharia, according to sacred law, we cannot poison wealth. We cannot kill livestock. We cannot cut down green trees. We cannot harm the elderly. We cannot harm women and children. This is a mutawatir hadith, a multiply attested hadith, a hadith transmitted through multiple chains of narration, undeniably, undoubtedly the words of the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. We do not harm women and children in warfare. We, cannot, we can't even attack people while they're sleeping. This is Islamic law. They say the Prophet was a violent man. It's just a smoke screen. It's a magic trick. Someone's trying to pull the wool over your eyes. Thomas Carlyle said, the lies, the well-meaning zeal heaped around this man Muhammad are disgraceful to ourselves only. And that was a Christian. I can make a similar statement. What if I said, you know, Jesus Christ advocated violence. You would say, what are you talking about? He's the prince of, he's the prince of peace. Now keep in mind, Christians believe that Jesus is the God of the Old Testament, right? Now Jesus in the Old Testament commands the Israelites under Moses and Joshua to exterminate entire populations of men, women, children, animals, and trees. Jesus inspires Moses to stone a man simply because he picked up wood on the Sabbath. Jesus reveals in the Torah that if a man rapes an unbetrothed virgin outside the city limits, the rapist must give his victim's father 50 shekels of silver and he must marry his victim. You have to marry your rapist and they're never allowed to get a divorce. Jesus in the New Testament calls for a sword and when the Pharisees criticize his disciples for not washing their hands before they ate, he criticizes them for not killing their rebellious children as the law expressly states. The penalty for filial recalcitrance is death according to the Old and New Testaments. Jesus in Luke chapter 19 after giving us the parable of the king, he concludes by saying, but those enemies who do not accept me as their king, bring them hither and slay them before me. Right? And then he leads an armed siege of the Temple of Solomon. You see, everything I just said is true. But it doesn't make my premise true that Jesus was violent. Because he wasn't. It's just a smokescreen. Right? It's rhetoric at its finest. I can do the same thing, but I'm not a spin doctor. See, the prophet ordered executions. Yes, so did our current president when he was the governor of Texas. So does Arnold the governor. So did Moses. So did David. Right? 
Mr. Wood relates the story of, you know, Asma bint Marwan and many other similar stories in his online writings. Almost all of these stories Mr. Wood has taken from Guillaume's translation of the Sirah of Ibn Ishaq. What he doesn't realize, however, is that most Muslim scholars, the vast majority, consider this biography of the Prophet to be only somewhat reliable at best. He wrote it over 120 years after the death of the Prophet, and it is common knowledge that he took many of these stories from Jewish sources and traditions. If I borrowed a story about Jesus from the Talmud, what would you expect it to say? Yet go to any one of Mr. Wood's online writings about Islam, and you notice the first footnote, Sirat Rasulullah by Ibn Ishaq, and then Ibid, 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 same as above, same as above, same as above. That's all he's got. This story is totally spurious. It's apocryphal. Where is it in the Muwatta or Kitab al-Athar? Books written by eminent scholars of Hadith that predate Ibn Ishaq. You see, Ibn Ishaq is a biographer. He's a reporter. He's not a muhaddith. He's not a scholar of hadith. He's not verifying authenticity or chains of transmission. He's relating as much material as possible. There's no sanad for this story. There's no chain of transmission. It's apocryphal. If I said that Jesus was violent as a child because he killed his schoolmates and one of his teachers, you would say, what are you talking about, you stupid Muslim? That's from, this, that's from the infancy gospel of Thomas from the second century. That's apocryphal. That's spurious. That's pseudonymous. Exactly. Again, we have to be objective in our critical methodology. Same standards apply to both religions. According to Islamic law, we can't even attack people while they're sleeping. Now, in Iraq, not too long ago, 2,000-pound bombs were dropped on civilian populations of Muslims fast asleep in their beds. In the four years since the American invasion, some have uh, surmised that 400,000 civilians have been killed in four years. How long was the Prophet Muhammad's ministry? 23 years long. If you were to count up all of the casualties and all of the battles of the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, during his entire life, Muslim and enemy casualties, how many do you think you'd get? 400,000? 200,000? 50,000? 20,000? 5,000? 2,000? About 1,500. 1,500. You know, according to uh, the Bible, Exodus 32, when Moses descended Sinai, he saw his people worshiping the golden calf. He ordered the instigators killed. 3,000 men fell on one day by order of Moses, right? 3,000, twice the number of all the people killed and all of the battles of the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, during his entire 23-year ministry. And you want to call someone violent? At the conquest of Mecca, when the Prophet entered the holy city with 10,000 companions, the people of Mecca knew that he was well within his rights to punish all of them. These are the same people who had killed and tortured his family members and companions for over 20 years. But when he came into the city, he had his head down like this, in humility before God, like a servant. Not like these kings who bang on their drums, standing on their saddles with women orbiting around them. His head was down like this. They say his beard was touching the back of his riding beast. And then he came into the city and he said, today is a day of mercy, the exaltation of the Quraysh, a day of mercy. And then he came into the Kaaba, the shrine of Abraham. And he said, Ja al haqq wa al al batil. Truth has come and falsehood has perished. And then he climbed Mount Safa, where 20 years earlier, he was jeered and insulted and stoned. And he called everyone out of their houses where they were hiding and out of the haram, out of the sanctuary. And they all gathered around him, thousands of them. And he stood up and he said, La tathriba alaykum al yom, yaghfiru lahu lakum. Khalas. This day, there was no blemish upon you. God has forgiven all of you. The Prophet was magnanimous. Magnanimous. He forgave people when in a position of power. If someone's about to kill you and you say, I forgive you, that shows a lot of character, right? Imagine someone's been trying to kill you for over 20 years and has been killing your family members and companions for over 20 years, and now you're in a position to kill them, but you forgive them. That's magnanimous. So the fact that the prophet wielded a sword to defend his people does not invalidate him as a prophet of the God of Abraham. Moses, Joshua, Isaiah, and David did the same according to the Bible. The fact that the prophet practiced polygamy does not invalidate him as a prophet of the God of Abraham. Abraham, Jacob, Moses, Solomon, who had over 700 wives, according to the Bible, did the same thing. The Jews at the time of Jesus practiced polygamy. And there isn't a single word of reproach uttered against this by Christ in the canonical Gospels. In fact, Islam did not invent polygamy. It restricted and regulated it. The prophet was not possessed. He never attempted suicide. He never raised his hand to a woman, a child, or a servant. 
He never allowed rape or torture or spousal abuse. He did not commit genocide upon the Jews of Medina. He did not steal his adopted son's wife. He was not immoral. And the satanic story, satanic versus story, is a straight up fabrication. And I, and I challenge anyone who says otherwise. We're just getting warmed up. I have answers for all of this stuff. <laughs> the prophet did, however, reform and eventually abolished slavery and gave women unprecedented rights even for the 20th century. Mr. Wood's presentation reminded me of the magicians of Pharaoh, right? They're trying to, you know, cast a spell over the audience to create an illusion. But then Moses showed up with the truth. Remember the Quran says, the Quran, you will hear much that will grieve you from the Jews and Christians. But you need to show patience and self-restraint. Jesus told his disciples, according to Matthew, blessed are you when men revile you and persecute you and say all kinds of evil against you falsely, falsely. Rejoice and be exceedingly glad, for great is your reward in heaven, for they persecuted the prophets who came before you. So the fact that there are people in the world who love the prophet so much that they're willing to die for his cause. And at the same time, there are people in the world who love the holy prophet so much, that, that, that hate the prophet so much, that they're willing to die to suppress his cause, is proof enough for me that Muhammad is a prophet. Sallallahu alayhi wasallam. Now, Justin Martyr, who is a second century proto-Orthodox theologian, he wrote a book called Dialogue with Trifo the Jew, in which he tries to uh, advance the legitimacy of Jesus by appealing to Old Testament prophecy. And again, we're switching gears here. We want to be balanced in our examination. So are there any prophecies of the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, in the Bible? Again, according to the earliest Christian scholars, the greatest proof of legitimacy is fulfillment of prophecy. Yes, there are many prophecies, and there are so many and so succinct that God says in the Quran, يَعْرِفُونَهُ كَمَا يَعْرِفُونَ أَبْنَاهُ they know him like they know one of their own sons. Twice in the Tanakh, in the Old Testament, he's mentioned by name. By name. Song of Songs, Shira Hashirim. I mentioned this to Mike Lacona last time. He, there was no answer there. Chapter 5, verse 16. His mouth is most sweet, he is altogether lovely. Such is my beloved, and he is my friend, O ye daughters of Jerusalem. In the original Hebrew, His mouth is most sweet, he is Muhammad. This is the Arabic version of the Bible, the last part of that. Again, he's mentioned in the book of Haggai, chapter 2, verse 7, in reference to the blessed night journey and ascension of the holy prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, from Jerusalem. Once again, I shall shake the nations. And himda of all nations shall come here. And the glory of this latter house shall be greater than the former. And in this place, I will give shalom, or salam, din de shlama in Syriac, dinul islam in Arabic. The Hebrew himda, translated most desired, is etymologically identical to Ahmad. And Ahmad is the superlative form of the name Muhammad, which means the most praised, the most desired, the most coveted, the most lovely, so on and so forth. Now, I'm running out of time, uh, but when I come back, I'm going to talk about, <clears throat> inshallah, God willing, the most famous Christian polemic against Islam, the marriages of the Holy Prophet, peace be upon him, in particular, his marriage to Ummul Mu'minin Aisha, radiallahu anha, and we're also going to look at the biblical criteria for prophethood. But I want to mention a, a few last things here. Again, keeping in mind that according to Christianity, Jesus is the God of the Old Testament. That's an established belief. In Numbers chapter 31, Jesus tells Moses to execute all Midianite men, boys, married and divorced women, and only the young girls who have not known a man to keep alive for yourselves. Now, how do they know if a girl was a virgin or not? By raping them. This is the answer. It then states that 32,000 young girls had been discovered, discovered as not knowing men, right? And were taken and placed into the custody of the men of Israel. The exegesis of Numbers chapter 31 in the Talmud, Tana'im Midrash Sifri 157, states that girls as young as three years and one day were forcefully consummated into marriage. Three-year-old girls were raped by order of Jesus Christ. This is Christian belief, and there's no way out of it for you. There's no way out of it. You believe Jesus is God? Yes. You believe the Old Testament is the inerrant word of God? Yes. So you are stuck in this quagmire, unless you're a Marcionite. I doubt any Christian here 
It's a Marcionite. You believe that the God of the Old Testament was an inferior God. No, you believe that was Jesus. What's your solution? Change your theology. Does God get sent his final messenger, his holy apostle, Muhammad al-Mustafa, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, to lift you out of this quagmire? What tabi'uhu la'allakum tahdadun? If you would but follow him, that you would be guided. Now, <clears throat> I want to answer to, you know all these stories, Abu Afak, the singing girls, this and that, uh, that he brought up. None of these are based on hadith. Again, his primary source is the Sirah of Ibn Ishaq. There's no hadith source for these stories. These are apocryphal stories. No Muslim takes these stories seriously. Right? Now, in his online writings, Mr. Wood also says that finding scientific inaccuracy in hadith does not invalidate the prophet as a prophet of God. That's what he says in his, in his online writings, that if there are scientific inaccuracies in the hadith, not in the Quran, in the hadith, this does not invalidate him. But today, tonight, he's quoted hadith to us. Maybe he had a, a change of heart. You know, the fly in the drink, you know, read, uh, there's, there's long been evidence of uh, bacterial phages that develop on flies, right? I mean, there's many interpretations for these things, but this is sci I, can, I can quote the scientific journal to you, right? What else did he say? Oh, satanic verses. The prophet was possessed. Or the prophet, uh, he, uh, he uh, was suicidal, things like that. We have to, I have answers for all of this stuff. Now, I want to speak to one of them, uh, saying that the prophet was possessed by a demon. This is a very common charge amongst the prophets of God. Jesus' own family thought he was possessed by a demon. Mark chapter 3, verse 21. When they went out to lay hold of him, they said, he is insane, he is mad. He has a demon, he's majnoon. His own family thought Jesus was possessed by a demon. Now the prophet's initial, initial diagnosis was, this is true, that he might have been possessed. He's being very honest, you see. He is a sadiqul amin. He's a spirit of truth and trustworthiness. He's not huffing and puffing, coming down the mountain, saying I'm the messenger of God with his nose in the air. No, he's being very honest. He is sadiqul amin. He is honest. So he goes to his wife, and she reassures him, but she was no expert. So who did they go to? A Christian scribe. They go to a Christian scribe, and, she, and he, Nimwaraka bin Naufal, he tells him, this is the Namus, which is the Arabic for the Greek, Nomos. The first five books, also called the uh, Pentateuch and the uh, Septuagint version of the Old Testament, is called Nomos, meaning sacred law. So Waraka says, this is a sacred, this is a Christian talking, a Christian talking. Now Jesus, according to the Bible, he was, uh, he was tempted by Satan in the wilderness. And it had an effect on him. It had an effect. Satan successfully lured him to an exceedingly high mountain. Right? Ex exceedingly high. Apparently Matthew thought, you know, and showed him all the kingdoms of the world. Apparently Matthew thought that the world was flat in those days because the higher the mountain, 